Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate investment expert Jay Tenenbaum. Now, Jay is the co founder and president of Capital Development and Loss Mitigation at Scottsdale REI, a private equity real estate investment firm specializing in acquiring assets nationwide. Now, in his career, Jay has acquired over 500 distressed mortgage notes and properties in over 40 states and attributes his success and expertise to his ability to effectively integrate his 20 years of experience as a former debt collection professional. Now, Jay's unique skill set lies in his ability of turning non-performing assets into positive cash flowing assets. And so, guys, with that, it's my honor to welcome Jay Tenenbaum to the show. Jay, how are you doing today? Terrific, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us here. Excited to peel back the curtain and, and take a look behind the scenes at your business and what it is you guys do over there. And so maybe for those, Jay, maybe we'll start off this way. For those that aren't familiar with you and, and don't know anything about you, maybe take a few moments and tell us more about yourself, your background, and ultimately how you found your way into the real estate world. Sure. So um, real, real, yeah. So um, I have been in the, in the mortgage, distressed mortgage note space since 2013. Uh, prior to that, I was a debt collection attorney for over 20 years. Um, I basically found my way in the debt in the, in the mortgage side, just from the standpoint of, well, I've been in debt all my life, just not personally. Um, so, um, you know, in that regard, uh, you know, in, in doing debt collection and then, and then turning around and doing, uh, you know, distressed mortgage notes, it's the same debt instrument, di di different debt instrument, but the same kind of realm mm -hmm. of all that generating cash flow is kind of the, the, you know, what our, what our mission and our forte truly is. I mean, um, you know, I grew up in, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, uh, par uh, my parents were in the restaurant business. I thought that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, one night, my dad says, you know, get out of this business. We're getting a profession. So I went to law school. Um, and, you know, from debt collection to to now being a real estate investor is, you know, how I, how I found my way. <laughs> And talk, to, talk to me about how that transition actually happened. I mean, from truly getting out of practicing law and, and getting on the other side. I mean, you know, what did that pivotal moment look like? So it's kind of a, of a transitionary, a transitionary phase. Um, I got out of managing, you know, the, the law practice, practicing law was a lot of fun. Managing 45 hanging out employees was horrible. And that really burned me out after about 20 years of doing that. I then spent the next three years between 2009 and 2012, um, we were now investing in, I was, I was investing in, in judgment liens in California and doing the execution of real property. It wasn't hitting banks, it wasn't garnishing wages, just one, you know, one way of, of enforcing the judgment. We were buying judgment liens from debt buyers, debt sellers. And so I got to learn a little more about real estate and priority of title and things like that than I really knew before. Because prior to, to that, my law practice days, I was so far inside my practice. Yeah, I lived in, you know, owned a, couple, a home here or two that, that I lived in, but really, as I'm an expert in, in distressed mortgage notes, I probably didn't even know what the promissory note, the deed of trust I was signing back then. Um, so circa, you know, 2013, um, you know, found my way into the opportunity to buy distressed mortgage notes, knew that there was something I could do, um, and it just kind of took off from there. Okay, fantastic. So. You know, really looking back, you know, for those that are listening that that went through, you know, the the last Great Recession, you know, started in 2008, but really, but really carried on for a number of years thereafter, just a, a litany of, of foreclosures and, and defaulted notes across the country, millions of them. And, you know, so really, I, I guess I, I remember back then uh, a number of, of, of guys that, that I knew leading into 2008 that were whatever their business was, whether they own rental properties or they were a syndicator, it seemed as though like there's a big contingent of them that either completely, or they opened up a complete uh, uh, independent division in their company, or they just completely shifted from what they were doing because it wasn't working anymore. And they got into the note game, um, more specifically the stress note game. Now, 2008, 9, 10, and even probably a few years thereafter, there was just such a, uh, a significant supply, oversupply of, of, of these notes that banks were looking to get off their books. And so, but you know, that was a very different time than, than what it's looked like over the last couple of years. So I guess, talk to me about the, I guess the opportunity, I know you weren't buying notes back then, but you were still in the debt collection game. So you still had a, 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 an understanding of what the world looked like then to what it is now. So g give me a comparative uh, outlook on what the note business looked like then, what it looks like today. And, and, and more specifically, you know, where do you find the opportunity? Sure. Good question. So, um, yes, my prior experience kind of gave me a, a 30,000 foot overview of what's going on. And what I mean by that is 
starting the debt collection arena, right? You've got your credit grantors, you know, Discover Card, Capital One, et cetera, that way, 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 way back in the early 80s, let's call it, right? They, the evolution was, you know, they had distra- you know, defaulted credit cards. What, 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 what do I do? So they would, you know, send them out to attorneys and collection agencies to collect on this stuff. And then they realized, you know, it's getting a little too expensive. You know, your, your, your recovery rates aren't that great. So in the late 80s, they started selling off their distressed debt, right? And so let other let other debt buyers, et cetera, start, you know, sue and, and, and get judgments and, and all of that. Um, circa 2008, you know, 2007, whatever you want to call the, the, the crash, you know, whatever really truly started, you kind of had the same evolution in a bank, only in a different department. Meaning when the, we all know in the crash, the foreclosure rates went crazy. Banks were foreclosing on everybody. And then they got, you know, then Bank of America and others got a little bad press. They said, wait a second, why, I don't really do this anymore. So then they started in, you know, at least in California where it was, they started in, well, you know, we're going to make, you know, make you go to mediation and all this other stuff. And, you know, these things would go six months long. And when they wanted to modify, they were going to big charge to modify loans. Only they didn't know how to get out of the way to, to make it, to prove one, right? They would give, put somebody in a loan mod for six months before they made a decision. That wasn't working out. So lo and behold, ah, the light bulb turned on. What do we do next? Let's sell off our debt. It really didn't start till like 2010, 2011, really, mm-hmm. is when the wild, wild west started becoming the wild, wild west. If you talk to people, I got in at 13. I was not behind the curve, but those who got in in 10, 11 will tell you that banks had no clue what they had, what to do with it, what to sell it for. Um, but you also had a time period where, you know, these loans were underwater. You know, the Rust Belt, your, south, your southeast, you know, all these houses were underwater. So what do you do? Um, I think that was really, you know, you really, you know, you didn't have a post-COVID market where you could just buy a loan and pass the time, your loan would appreciate it. If you ever got it back, you would, you know, to get, you know, resell it, you know, wholesale the property, whatever. So loan mods became very, very prevalent back then because that was the best thing you could do. A win-win. You would generate cash flow because you didn't want the house and your borrower wanted to stay in it anyway, right? Mm-hmm. So... That was, and when I first got in this business, which is kind of ironic, is I asked the question, you know, right out the door, how long is this going to last? Three to five years, they said. Well, that was 2013, and we're still in a different evolution. So basically, what you had is you had the really was when it was distressed, when the whole country was distressed, to you know, gurus starting to turn, you know, turn out a lot of students doing this. I was a product of a, of a guy just like anybody else, um, and so the market got flooded with. Um, you know, with investors all over the place, it drove, it variably drove pricing up a little bit because people were not really paying attention to what they were buying and overpaying for stuff. And, you know, and then it kind of, you know, leveled out um, where in fact, uh, like 2015, like 2017, we were buying uh, property off of auction.com because the price of mortgage notes were, were getting too out of hand. About 18, 19, it started leveling off. And we got back in the market uh, post COVID primarily. Um, and then you saw where you didn't really matter, just like everything else. You didn't matter what your price of your loan was to some extent uh, that you're buying because you were getting taken. You know, now we're buying loans that have a ton of equity in them. Mm-hmm. So, for example, let's say we bought a loan that had like, the, the, the borrower owed $100,000, we bought for maybe $60,000, $60,000. But the houses were $300,000. We got paid off at auction. 2020, 2021, most of 22, we were getting we we're getting taken out at auction all the time. Now, while we still have equity in, in properties that we're buying, um, we're loan mods are still. We rather do a loan mod than take a property back and do a flip, just because it's gonna you know it's, the property's gonna sit on the market a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that's really the evolution of, of where of where we are and what we're doing. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Talk talk to me about the what what does the due diligence process look like uh, when you guys are looking at either an individual note or a tape of a tape of uh, notes. I mean, it's, these things are across the country. It's not just like they're in their backyard. I mean, I know that you don't necessarily care about the physical asset itself, but the physical asset is the. I mean, that's the security, right? Like th- th- there, sure. there's definitely due diligence that has to be done. So talk to me about doing that on a broad scale. Sure. So um, on a broad scale, you've got to have your team. You've got to have your outsourcing team in place as well. Like we use vendors. If we're doing a large purchase, we've got vendors that we can just outsource our title reports, our valuations, things like that. But in and, a, a simplistic and, form. Not, not to interrupt you, I'm sorry. What, 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 like define a large purchase. Is that like, you know, 30, 40, 50 notes, hundreds of notes? What does that What does that look like? It really all depends on, on a particular investor's, you know, area of expertise and their bandwidth. 
for okay. for me in my experience uh 20 30 no loans are probably we probably need outsource just because we probably want to close within two to three weeks and for us to do all of it manually would just be too cumbersome mm-hmm. um you know five or ten you could probably do with a snap not a big deal but maybe but if you're just starting out that would seem cumbersome to you as well right sure um so really in a simplistic way you're really looking at four main areas of diligence your valuation, you still want to know what the value of your property that you're, that secured, that you're, that you're getting secured by your mortgage is, right? Um, your chain of title. Now, it's not a title like who owned it from yesterday, who owned it, whatever. But when you sell it, when a loan is sold, originated to its soul, it's sold through an assignment of mortgage. So you want to verify that the assignment went from Bank of America to Kevin, to me, to whoever is intact, right? That there's a trail, a sufficient trail. You want to make sure that there is no outstanding that the delinquent property taxes have not uh, gone to sale and taken out your interest. Property taxes have priority over your mortgage. So if it goes to tax sale and you have the, and, and you have no more mortgage, you should be buying that loan. And then fourth for us, the, especially this in this time and days, is occupancy. Not to say that we care if we if the property is vacant or not, but our preference would be by occupied assets because we want to have somebody to talk to to do loan bonds. Now we've got all around the gamut. We let, you know, 21, 20, 21, 22, we were buying a lot of reverse mortgages. The borrowers were dead, the properties were vacant. We got taken out at auction, just a different strategy. And that's one thing that we love about this space is the, um, the variation, the, 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 the um, resourcefulness that you can bring to this business, right? All the different options that you have. Talk about if you if you actually purchase the note um, and, and the, you know, the mortgagee, ha- they've, they've vacated the property. I mean, your options at that point in time, you can't turn around and, and renovate and, and rent that property. But ultimately, like, what are your options at that point? You got to go through the entirety of that the foreclosure process at that point, correct? If you don't have someone to actually discuss a potential loan modification with and they want to stay in that home, is your is your last resort just to go through the foreclosure process? Primarily, yes. I mean, you okay. still have the obligation or the responsibility or the desire as the lender to board it up and, pre- and preserve it and secure it. Right. Right. You just don't have uh, one guy in Alabama went a little bit overboard, but you don't have the uh, the ability to go in and renovate it. Although I had a loan in Alabama once where uh, the guy bought the, the occupant, the owner of the, of the property bought it. Well, let me see. The guy I was dealing with bought the tax lien on the property and Alabama has a three year uh, right of redemption. So during those three years as a tax lien holder, I have the same rights as a lender, meaning I can preserve it. Now, this guy went out, renovated the bedroom, renovated the bathroom, rented it out. I mean, he went way over and beyond. And so it was a little interesting on how we ended up working it out with him. Uh, his, his whole idea was, you know, he, he, he spent like $200 on this tax lien, and his redemption amount was like uh, 20 grand. I'm like, no, I'm not paying you 20 grand. We ended up settling with the guy. We tried to figure out, like, who's to get whose check account? You want to buy me out and keep the property, right? Or do you want me to buy you out? Because at the end of the day, um, while he spent too much money on it, I was still getting, inheriting, I didn't end up writing him a check for a lot lesser than 18 grand because I was getting a fully renovated property with a tenant already in it. <laughs> like, why not? <laughs> it was an easy disposition there. So where are you sourcing, like primarily today, where are you sourcing your leads from? So, um, I like to say that I'm lazy and I don't like to hunt. And basically I've been very fortunate, very blessed that the relationships that I've built since I started this bit, since I started this business in August of 20, 2013 have led me to where assets, spreadsheets, tapes come to me, come to us, you know, unilaterally on, on, a, on a daily basis. It's not very often that I'll call. And, and if I do I need to call somebody and go, Hey, Joe, what do you have this week? What do you have this month? And I've been really fortunate that um, we've been able to buy what I call up till now, um, a forward flow type arrangement, meaning I can go to you and buy from you this month and go to you next month and say, what, what do you have next month? And you just go back to your inventory and give me the, the same, you know, more out of your inventory. So of working with 12 different sellers all, all the time, so, you know, hunting for who's got what, I'm like always doing something. In fact, we just negotiated a contract. We're buying 538 loans between now and June 30th from the same source. And, on, and, and the contract this ironically does say forward flow, mortgage loan, sale agreement. <laughs> Interesting. On average, are, are, no, I guess first question is, are these first liens? Yes, always. Okay. On average, I mean, 
discount? I mean, pennies on dollar. What what type of discount in this world today that we live in uh, are you buying these? It's gone up. Um, we're paying now this contract. Um, we're paying probably back in 13, you know, anything 40, 50 cents on the dollar was great. I was like almost routine. Um, I think if you're in the 60 to 70 range of legal balance these days, you're probably okay. A legal ba a balance of the original note. The what's what's entirely owed. Not okay. what not what not what the unpaid okay. principal balance is, but what's entirely owed. But that has no no relevance to the property at all as far as the value of the property, correct? Well, it, yes, no, it during does. your due diligence, it, 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 it'd be it'd be it'd be the low it'd be the lower of the value or the or the legal balance. If the half if the property's underwater, then you're looking at probably 60, 70 cents of the value. Whatever whatever's lower. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. For those that are, I mean, that, that are intrigued by this conversation, I mean, what, I mean, obviously you, you took some first steps uh, back in, I think it was that you said 13 when you really started going down this path. I mean, what are, uh, you know, where's a good place to find, you know, education information? Uh, do you have a website, uh, any podcasts, any books that you might recommend for folks that want to learn more about this, this industry? Sure. So um, there's really, I mean, there's a variety of books that, you know, it all depends on what your level of of desire is, um, I mean, there's, you know, you look up note investing, you've got guys, you know, friends of mine that got, you know, uh, Scott Carson, E-Speed, they, they're they probably the primary guys that, that do a lot of training uh, on this stuff. Um, we have a trade desk ourselves um, where we make the assets available to, you know, anybody now, if you, but, we, but we go one step further because if your listeners are saying, hey, I'm really intrigued by this, but I don't, I'm not educated, I don't know where to start, I'm scared to death of what I'm doing, right? Um, I got in this business primarily when I got the note side of it was, you know, as I started in the infinite stages of my real estate investing desires, I wouldn't call it a query, I didn't have one, but my desires, um, you go, you know, like anybody else, you go to the hotel ballrooms and three days of, of content, fire, fire hose information, but you ask yourself at the end of the, on Monday morning, where do I find my first deal? And I was fortunate enough with the relationships, et cetera, that I learned day one in my no buying for dummies workshop that I went to, that I had vendors that were there that I could, you know, look to, to buy assets from, right? So finding the availability is really key to me. And so what we do, because we know that, you know, people may not know how to do notes, whatever, we do have a concept called a forward contract. Like, you know, I love the word forward these days. So basically it's like, we, you, should, you should subscribe to our trade desk, follow us on our trade desk. You might see an asset, some property somewhere that you like. Now, what we do is we then, it's still a note, but what we do is say, okay, you'll enter into a, basically an option contract, more or less, a um, little more than an option contract, where is that we negotiate a price with you right now. You'll pay us a deposit. We'll manage the asset through his foreclosure for a fee. And when you pay the rest of the purchase price, when we deliver you the REO property, the property that you want. Or if you want to work out loan mods and get, get you know checks and whatever, we can work that out too. Um, so really, we'll kind of hold your hand in that regard. Um, that's really our trade desk. We are uh, talking with some other folks because um, we have our own podcast. We have our own um, software. And we have our own um, what we call an ROI calculator, which kind of plug and play you know, with the various exit strategy profitability may be. And we're in talks with another um, educational platform to kind of merge our resources of that nature into their education piece. Mm -hmm. So coming soon, basically I could tell you we have our own education piece, but we don't quite yet. Got it. Got it. No, no, fair enough. I appreciate that. And a couple other questions. Uh, I guess the funding, you know, talk to me about how are you guys funding these projects? I mean, when you're buying a tape with 20 or 25 notes, how, how are you going about funding those? Where's that capital coming from? Well, once upon a time, when I first started this business, I had blonde hair. No, I'm just kidding. Um, pulling my hair out in funding this stuff was, was always a challenge because we do things in this world, in our note world, backwards. Meaning, we don't do a whole lot. Of, we see a tape, we may filter it to what our desires are, you know, states or or whether it's occupied or whatever filters we like. Um, whether it's a, you know, we don't really typically buy manufactured homes and stuff like that. We may filter a tape out. If you take take a tape of 500 assets and drill it down to 300, maybe the 30 if you really wanted to, right? Um, and we make it a, a, for, a, a preliminary agreement on price with our seller. Then we start our diligence. And then we don't really go out and raise capital until we finish our diligence because we may go in a contract 
with 20 assets. But after diligence, 10 of them may drop out. So I'm not raising any capital until I know what, what I'm finally going to buy, right? So we've done, we've gone from JV arrangements to syndications. Um, now we have the, um, we're blessed with, we have, a, we, Scottsdale has, we have an institutional funder, funding source, debt and equity. So we don't have to raise any capital. We just go to our, our source. Um, we've made a substantial commitment for us for the next five years. Mm -hmm. So um, we are, are truly, I mean, it's all about relationships. It's all about, you know, gaining traction and speed. Um, I know in the intro, you know, I've done about 500 deals. We probably did about 300 deals just in, tw in 22 alone. So again, I need to maybe probably need to update that a little bit. <laughs> Talk to me about, give me a horror story, whether it's you or someone you know. Give me, give me an example of what can go wrong uh, in this space. Um, what from, the buy, wrong? from the buyer's side, from buy, buying distress notes, what can go wrong? Where's the risk? So your obvious risk, like I said before, is that you're buying a first position mortgage that's not a first position mortgage anymore, mm -hmm. meaning it got, it got lost a tax sale or maybe, you know, it got... Uh, you know, somehow maybe there's a, there was another lien in front of it that, a, that the title report didn't pick up or something. So now you're lien second or third or whatever like that. Um, so your horror stories, but here, here's the thing. That's your, your most definitive, harder to cure horror stories. Because what I said before, how you have so much variation and so much options um, to do something, your first preferred exit strategy may not be op available to you, but you have about 20 more to go after. So it's really kind of hard to say, I bought a horrible thing, right? Because at the end of the day, again, if time is no problem, just like anything else, if you turn something into cash flow and time is not, uh, not an issue for you, I can turn something that I thought I was going to get taken out at auction or I thought I was going to fix and flip, turn it into a rental or turn it into a seller finance right. loan. And I'm really not going to get hurt. Plus the discounts that I buy this stuff out, I'm pretty insulated on, on, on where I'm at now. Um, as far as horror stories, um, the, probably the biggest horror story I have is actually, well, yeah, I guess it was a note. We bought a loan in Connecticut uh, a little over about a year and a half ago. And Connecticut has an interesting law where if there's limited equity or no equity in the property, it really doesn't go to a foreclosure sale. It's called a strict foreclosure, meaning I get the, as the lender at a certain time and when the foreclosure is finished, I just get the property back. Okay. Okay. So we got, so we bought this loan and we knew that the law day we'd get the property reverber back to us was like a month to a month or two out. So we knew it was going to be a pretty quick turn, right? We knew it was occupied, right? So we realized, okay, so now we own, now the asset reverted to us, right? Through our sale. And now we have to get evict the occupant. And remember, I didn't call him a tenant because here's a guy who said, I made a deal with a dead guy because the underlying loan was reverse mortgage. The borrower was dead. He says, I made a deal with the borrower to buy the house. Do you have it in writing? No. It was about six years. He didn't have a rental agreement, so he wasn't a tenant either. Right? Well, in Connecticut, we still had to go to mediation as far as the post foreclosure eviction. At mediation, he agrees, I'll vacate in three months. I may be interested in buying the house. We'll have that conversation. But if nothing else, I'm going to vacate in three months. Um, the eve of the third month, he starts filing the most frivolous stuff I've ever seen in, in my life. Oh, boy. And it took about a year to get him out. He went so far as to say, okay, so, so um, Scottsdale is an LLC um, in, originated in, in Utah. And with the, when you're buying no loans, you don't have to register in every state. You have to be a foreign corporate, foreign entity in another state. Well, what this guy, this ultimately, with all the appeals and, and, and challenges and everything else, the courts finally just said, you know what? Anything you're filing, I'm not even going to accept it anymore. But I, we have an interesting opinion from a judge the day we finally got him out, where the guy's latest argument was, I got to give style points for creativity. I do. Um, he basically said, he basically registered Scottsdale REI in Connecticut and Arizona and says, that company is now mine. What's well, not true. And the judge's opinion said, I find this argument to be frivolous. Basically, what you're saying is, I could be Elon Musk for the day if I, if I so choose. <laughs> and the judge wrote that. We thought it was hilarious, right? Um, so finally, we, we got, so then we tried, we went to, we got, now we have the order in hand to evict him. 
He barricades himself in the door, in the, in the house. The federal, the, the uh, poli local police won't help the constable get him out. We finally had federal marshals come in and get him out. And he's still driving us nuts. He's changing oh, locks God. and barricading, putting chains over the state, still thinks that he's got this, 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 this LLC that owns the property, whatever. Um, so that's probably the, 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 okay. the nightmare. For, that for, sounds like a there. headache. And that's been going on for how long? <laughs> a little over a year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that definitely could uh, give some gray hairs for sure. <laughs> well, well, fair enough. I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you being uh, vulnerable there and uh, sharing that story. I mean, there's, there's always war stories, right? And whatever niche you choose to go in, there's always going to be a war story. And if you haven't had one yet, you just haven't been doing it long enough. So exactly. That's true. It's very true. Jay, for those that want to learn more about you and, and you know, what you got going on, I know you said you had a podcast as well. Where can they track you down to get more information, your website or are there other places to go? Sure. Our website is www.scottsdalerei.com. REI does not stand for the camping store. It's our, it's real estate investments, REI, Scottsdale REI. Um, we do and sign up for our trade desk, follow our trade desk. You can probably learn a lot with, on a trade desk. We have a call once a month where we kind of spotlight a certain asset and kind of go walk through what the uh, extra strategy, preferred extra strategies could be. Um, if you learn to get some information there, um, our podcast is uh, the real estate mastermind live, which is actually, our podcast radio show because we're actually on a radio on Saturday mornings in the station out of San Francisco. Hmm. Um, and, and, we're, and, our, and our podcast is really, um, in fact, um, I'm pretty sure you've reached out to Tyler and probably going to be on our, our show at some point. Um, Cause basically we just, we just interviews like this, other in, in real estate guys in all walks of life, usually investors in stuff that we don't know nothing, we know nothing about, which has been very entertaining. Um, Cause it's not all about notes. In fact, we barely, Rarely, we've had a, a few of our colleagues and stuff on the show, but we've had we've had people, you know, syndication attorneys and and I, you know, direct, uh, IRA companies and other multifamily guys and whatever. So it's really just a nice conversation mm -hmm. with anything real estate. Is really what what it's what it's all about, because um, that's what it's all about, right? You, you give you give back and you and you just you give your other colleagues a platform, whatever walk of life Absolutely. you're investing in. No, I agree with you, and guys, I'll be sure to put all that in the show notes as well of how you can reach out and learn more about Jay and what he's got going on. Well. Uh, Jay, it's been a lot of fun, man. I appreciate you coming on the show, and I know that you're in the middle of a move, and so I appreciate you jumping in here and uh, and doing this interview with us. And so, and, and best best luck to you and your move. Uh, as I told you before we started interviewing here, it's just uh, those are all you know, just it's so much stress going on. You got your business that you're operating, and you've got you know moving your household, and so wish you all the best with that. I appreciate that. It's like the old Jackson Brown song, right? Where there's where they say the roadies are packing up everything, cause, but they yeah. come for your piano last, come for my computer last, because I still That's got work it. to do until 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 I don't. <laughs> absolutely. I Absolutely. Well, Jay, again, thank you for joining us. It's been a lot of fun having you. My pleasure, Kevin. Thank you so much. All right, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. And so until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Butt, wishing you huge success. Take care now.